Hey, I'm Chris Joe the Glamping Guy. Thank you for uh, joining me here on this extension on, just on YouTube. It's an extension of podcast number four with Zach Stoltenberg. So if you listen to the first 45 minutes of that talk, you learn a lot about Zach. You see why he's an expert in the glamping community. Uh, he's the hospitality director for Clockwork and works with glamping specialists, uh, glamping operators all over the world. But he's putting action into his skill by actually opening up his own glamping operation. And that's what we do here on this podcast in this extension. I had to pull it into YouTube only just because you really do want to see the visuals that he has. He shares the screen with me and goes through his site development. He has renderings of all of his uh, all of his tents and, and actually live models. Really, it's much more than just a back of napkin kind of uh, vision. It's, it's real pictures that you can see. He also shares all the downloads that he has written up and, and compares it to case law and the, the town uh, code and, and how he's meeting all the requirements uh, for, for a development like this. And he shares about a neighbor of his who has threatened to take him out of the picture and, and challenge his glamping operation. And finally, Zach and, uh, concludes about how his, his vision for this is with his wife and how they're enjoying the development of this. He's breaking ground here in a week or two, and he kind of gives a timeline of how he's going to launch this in uh, 4th of July, 2025 is his, is his goal. The glamping guy will probably be there to celebrate. So thanks for joining us at this extension on YouTube. And while you're here, press like and subscribe, because if you're not normally here, this is a, this is a wonderful time to support the Glamping Guy uh, work that I'm doing. I want to help landowners develop safe, legal, and profitable operations on their private property. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. So help me out and click like and subscribe. All right, without further ado, here's Zach Stoltenberg, the expert gone glamper. Property. How long have you lived your pro on your property? Since 2012. So, 12 so, years. so you've been there for 14 years or 12 years. So that's, uh, that, that's wonderful. Okay. Take it away, Zach. Let's see what you got. So just like we discussed, you know, here's kind of Metro Kansas city. Here's Lawrence. Here's Topeka. Those are kind of the three biggest cities in Northeast Kansas. The only other city that's of comparable size in the whole state is Wichita, which is about three and a half hours to our South. It's, it's near the Oklahoma border. And Tonganoxie is the little town that I live in right here. Nice, nice. It's a great small town. So we have about 5,000 people. It's definitely a bedroom community for, for Lawrence and for Kansas City. But we've got wonderful schools, which is a big reason my wife and I moved here. You know, we've, we've got four kids, which I know that you think that's a good start. But Small um, little family. Yeah. But for us, it was it was great. So my kids' school is right here. I live right here. You know, it's, it's been a wonderful small town, a, a wonderful place to, to raise a family. And, you know, we, we've really love living here and and that's honestly that's been one of the big i think one of, one of the big reasons behind why i would like to do something here on my property it, it's not just sharing you know the the connections to nature giving people that respite creating this this cool retreat place for people to come and enjoy camping and being outdoors i also want to share my little town we love it here we've got you know, some great little mom and pop shops and restaurants and some fun things to do. We, we've got some some great local businesses that I want to support. In fact, I was was actually having a discussion with a farmer that, that runs a, a kind of farm tourism business near me. And he recommended that I apply for some grants through the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. They got a grant and he said, there's a specific grant right now that's available for up to fifty thousand dollars from the state of kansas and it's for people that want to start a business that supports other small business that's the, that's the key in it to qualify for the grant whatever you're doing i mean yes it can be your small business you can make money doing it but it needs to directly or or indirectly benefit other small businesses in the state that's what this this money is specifically your market gotcha and you're providing yeah, housing so, for the for the flower people and the yeah. and people coming to a town with no hotel and and no, no accommodations yeah. yeah so you know the glamping is, is a great thing in and of itself bringing people to this area sharing my small town with them but it's also accommodations for three different wedding venues and two different yeah. farm tours and five different farm winery businesses around Perfect. us and all of these other events and, and things that happen throughout the year. And and that's this is really filling a need that is not currently being met in this area. And he's like, that's that's exactly what this grant is is for. And he's like, you you need to apply for it because so few things qualify for that. And and 
you know, this kind of checks all the boxes. So we're, yeah, we're looking there's your that. property. So here's my property. And like I said, we're, we're just about five acres right here. I'm on a dead end paved road. I do have a couple of neighbors and I, I'm going to get into that in a minute. I've got one neighbor to the north here and he owns kind of most of this property north of the road. And then I've got a, a couple neighbors in here. There's actually one new house that they just built right here. So kind of along the road, I've got really three neighbors here that are around me, but you know, five neighbors total. total. And I'm only about not even a quarter mile here off of Chieftain Road, which is, is also 20, 2440 highway. So this is kind of the main highway, the main thoroughfare that runs runs down to the interstate here. Okay. So when I started off kind of looking at my property, what could I do? And, and this actually, this shows pretty clearly, you can see where I mowed. So this is the area that we were looking at. What could we do something with it? And, you know, it's kind of pretty. I mean, my wife and I love it. That's why we bought the house. That's why we built here. And I almost, I take it for granted. Like, I wake up, I look out my master bedroom windows down the vineyard rows, and I see this view every day. Yeah. And it, it's only when we have an Amazon driver that pulls in the driveway and gets out and is like, oh man, this is really nice. I never knew. You know, this that way. is not uncommon. The, the, yeah. the people that I talk to, like all my students and stuff, they 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 think their property is like whole hum until yeah. someone comes and visits and it's like wow this is that. like when I, I came and visited your place like oh this is nice and and we do we take it for granted i think it's human nature i think all of us do this so we sat down with that and and i looked at a lot of different examples and as nice as my property is i still felt like something was missing i said you know if I, I need a focal point. I need something to kind of build this thing around right Water. if i don't have a focal point you know, the most obvious kind of view or vista is my neighbor's horse barn, which is, is not really that great of a, a view, you know. And we, we've always talked about building a pond on the property. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I looked at the, the history and the abstract of our property, I actually found that back in, I think it was roughly 1996, so like 20 years ago, 20 plus years mm -hmm. ago, there was a pond on the property and i i actually got the the second piece of that story just a few weeks ago so i i called i've, I've had three different pond contractors come out walk the property with me to to give me some quotes and estimates it's really important to do that and, and this is for your listeners so the the first pond consultant that i had come out quoted me thirty six thousand dollars to build this pond it's about a half an acre pond and he was talking about we've got to do soil testing to make sure it will hold water very important if i didn't know that there was already a pond there 20 years ago and he said we've got to do lidar scans of the whole site i said i've got updated current topo maps from gis that are, are right off the the site they look to be pretty accurate they're down to two foot increments can we do can we use that and he's like, no, we got to fly it. We got to drone it. I said, well, how much is that out of your $36,000 bid? Oh, it's about four grand to get the LIDAR done. And he, he didn't seem really willing to want to work with me. And it was just like, this is what it is. It's expensive. Take it or leave it. And he might have a lot of customers and clients that, that like that and that works for them. That wasn't me. And <laughs> so then I called the second guy and he came out and looked at it. He said, oh, I bet you're looking every bit of twenty five to thirty thousand dollars for this. And I was like, well, you know, that's and honestly, that was where I expected it to be. When I when I built my pro forma, when I built my cost and all my numbers, I put thirty grand in for for the pond. So he said twenty five to thirty, that was under my threshold. I was like, all right, you know, we're we're getting there, we're getting closer. And the last guy that I called who built my neighbor's pond to the south, who my neighbor to the west has three ponds. And when we first moved in, they were cleaning all those ponds out. This is the guy that did it. And so I called him and I was like, hey, you remember me? He's like, yeah, 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 you're, you're up on the hill up there. I said, yeah, I said, we want to do a pond. And he goes, well, you had a pond. I said, I know, <laughs> like 20 years ago, I found it in the aerial photos. And he's like, yeah, there was a real estate developer that was going to build homes through that whole area. And he hired me to come out and plow that pond under. That was a really nice pond. That was a beautiful pond. I said, well, can we put it back in? He goes, yeah, absolutely. When do you want me to come take a look at it? I said, I can meet you tonight. So when I got home from work about six o'clock that night, he met me here at the house. We went down, we walked it. I said, do you have any idea kind of cost or numbers? I said, I'm not going to hold you to it. You know, you can give me a formal estimate or something, send it to my email. That's fine. But just kind of shooting from the hip, what do you think? He goes, well, we'll probably be here about two weeks. 
So that's 12 grand because is that something love the locals? That I didn't want to like jump out of my boots, but I said, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Put me on your schedule. Let me know yeah. as soon as you can get out here. Sweet. That's awesome. So sort you of, you have it finished already according to the picture. No, 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 no. This is a <laughs> rendering. So I'll, I'll run through this real quick, kind of fly the model. And, and some of this, I've honestly got some good breaks on. I said the, the pond was one of them. Goes up the dead yeah, end. So here's the house up there in the, up the hill a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And I, I really do, I want to keep my residence and the resort area separate. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So we're, I've got two dogs. I don't want the dogs running down, harassing, glamping guests. I, I don't want, you know, any bother to my neighbors or anything like that. So we're, we're actually going to fence off this in between. So my yard will, will get a bit smaller, about an acre and a half. And then these, these lower three, three acres or so will become the glamping resort. So one of the lucky breaks that I got is my property already has two curb cuts. So we have an existing gate and a culvert. I don't have to go through city approvals or anything for the the second driveway. It's already there. It's existing. And I knew that there was some gravel in there. I wasn't sure how far it went, but I was able to get my tractor out and start dragging grass and topsoil away until I hit gravel. So I have an existing road and existing kind of gravel parking area that's there. So that's going to be my main parking lot for for the glamping guests. And again, because it's existing, it's not anything I have to get permitted or approved. I am going to improve it. We're going to we're going to haul in some more gravel and freshen it up a little bit, but it's it's current, it's there and I can use it. Sweet. So the pond is going to sit right kind of in the middle of the property. We do want to have just kind of a, a spot where people can kind of sit sit down, hang out. You know what? Can I point something out? Yeah. You could barely see, just if you backed up a little bit, you could barely see your neighbor's house roof. Yeah. So that was actually one of the reasons that I, I wanted to put this in 3D and I wanted to have a model. After I talked with my pond guys, they told me, you know, based on the elevations and where everything's at, I'm looking at about a 12 foot high dam on, mm-hmm. on this downhill side. And then I was able to model a 12 foot high dam yeah. on my property. Yeah, they- and then... You know, when those neighbors are like, well, how's this going to impact me? What are we going to see? Might appreciate, they might appreciate might appreciate the better view. Yeah, they're they're not really going to see any of it from where yeah. they're at. And more importantly, my guests aren't going to see their um, horse barn or their um, RV or their trailers or their cars or their trucks or all of the other random assortment stuff that comes with owning horses. You know, again, it's not the best look. I live in the country. I live in an area where people choose to live because they want to be left alone and yeah. and they're, you know, leave each other alone. Right. So I'm not going to complain about my neighbor's yard. It's not something that I want to look at. Right. And so, you know, part of what we're doing with some of the landscaping and the grading and the building of the pond, it's to create kind of more of an inward focus for, for my guests, for my, my resort stays. Sweet, sweet. Uh, and for my listeners, if they're not watching this on YouTube, you could probably want to go to the YouTube. I'll put some screenshots on the on the web page and all that. But uh, for the full full uh, experience to see what this is, you're, you're going to have to jump into the Glamping Guy YouTube page and actually see Zach's uh, rendering here. So then, uh, you know, after we kind of came up with a site plan, let me go go way up, take us up to the ten thousand foot view here. I started laying out where I thought we could get some possible sites. I also know, you know we need to get some utilities and infrastructure into this. And so my water line is out here at the road. Even though I am in city limits, the city does not have a sewer line in my area. That was actually the only point of contention when I met with them for my pre-app hearing was mm-hmm. they said, and and I'm asking for, and I'm gonna get into the planning and zoning stuff here in a minute, because I've got a lot of documents to show, but I'm asking for 10 units in this plan. We're gonna start with phase one is gonna be three units. It's these three right here. A phase two will be these four at the back. That'll bring us up to seven. And then these two down at the bottom here will be the last two units that we'll do. And I count this unit as two units because it is two tents, but it's one site. So it's nine sites, 10 tents. This is going to be our family unit. And so I kind of figured where, you know, with some even spacing, all these are 60 to 80 feet apart. Again, I don't have a heavily wooded site. I'm going to need some privacy kind of between units. This first unit up at the top here is going to be an ADA unit because it's right off of my parking area. It's a pretty flat level grade between those two, and it's it's a pretty sizable unit. And so you kind of come in to the tent, 
You got your bedroom area doing wood stoves in all of these units because we do want to operate year round and it gets cold in the winter in Kansas. And so the back here is a full bathroom with a walk-in shower and a bidet style toilet. Nice. And then we come out to the back porch and I know you love your hot tubs. Yeah. And I hear the complaints from every single operator that I work with of how much they hate their hot tubs. Oh, we're done with hot tubs. And did I tell you? Oh, yeah, we got rid of them. We're, we're, we're through. We're, we're, we're one of those complainers. We hate yeah. hot tubs. We were all tubs, bathtubs. That, that's a good move. So <laughs> that's what we're doing is deep soaker tubs. Guests yep. can fill them when they want to use them. When they're done, they drain them. We got a little outdoor shower here. And then each of our sites is going to have its own little campfire circle chairs, kind of an area to hang out on, on nice. the exterior of the unit. And then all the units will look out onto the pond. And again, I'm not unique in this. You know, we, we've looked at some very, you know, there, there's been good precedent for this, right? Anybody that's studied Isaac French and, and some of the resort development that, he, that he's, he's done, or you look at Live Oak Lake down in Waco, right? Exact same concept. They built a lake in the middle. They built seven very high-end units around it just sold it last year for almost a million dollars a key. Yeah, they did. And and so, you know, again, I felt like I don't have to do something crazy. Other people have done it. They've proven it. It's a model that works. I'm just going to learn from them and kind of take advantage of that. And and I don't know yet what our final units are going to be. They may be tents. It may be domes. It may be a yurt or something unique. You know, I, I don't know. But the one thing... When I, are you breaking ground? When, when are you actually digging up the the pond and making it happen the pond should start sometime in the next couple of weeks oh wow oh that's and, exciting yeah and like, i want to get through the design and then i'll give you kind of an update on progress and where we're at okay. with it okay sounds good the one thing though that i i absolutely knew that i wanted to do and i wanted to try to do it as cost effective as possible you know even looking at some of the really affordable tents on the market, you know, some of the white duck are, are great options for beginners, for starters. You're still looking at twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars per tent. It's a lot of money, and and it's a good tent. It's a quality product. You're going to get three to five years out of it before you're ready to upgrade to something. And that's a great little starter unit. But I said, you know, really, Zach, like you're creative, you're a smart guy. This is a challenge every one of your clients has ever had. Now it's your challenge. Figure it out. Come up with something better. And so. I looked at what could I do with a $500 Amazon tent that I can make some upgrades and some improvements, which we've seen a lot of glamping resorts do. You know, they're, they'll cut the hole in the canvas and put in a solid door. They'll install some windows, you know, just with some timber and framing in there. So again, I, I'm learning from those that have come before me and, and taking the ideas of, of people that were creative and did it first. It's nothing new or unique. I'm going to try it. We're going to do it. And so this is the first unit that we're going to build. It's got a soaker tub, 48-inch vanity. It's got a little fireplace in the unit. We've got a concierge, just a mini fridge and microwave, king-size bed. And then around the back here, we've got the rest of the bathroom with a toilet and a full walk-in shower. Nice. And my goal, I want to be able to build this for under $25,000 total. Sweet. All in all the interior, all the landscaping everything in mm -hmm. i want to see if i can do it for under 25. nice and this last one that we're going to build this is what i'm calling our, our family unit so these two tents are actually from walmart it's a, a 10 by 12 hunting outfitters tent and <laughs> the 12 by 20 of the same model so i'm working with those they are i think 300 for the small one and i think maybe 700 for the large one obviously we're going to make some improvements we're going to put some interiors in it this is like a kid's unit. So we got a bunk bed on one side and then around the back, just a, a toilet and a sink only. Mm -hmm. So a half bath in the kid unit and then coming out to the, the main unit, got a little more space in here. So we've got a full king bed, plenty of space around. Still have our little concierge, still have our wood stove. And then you kind of come to the back here with another full bath. So again, 48 inch vanity. And then coming around the corner, we have a toilet and a full walk-in shower. Nice. A tub shower. Because again, yeah. a parent who's out there, little kids knows you got to have a bathtub. When you <laughs> so we're going to have a tub in this one. And then really, again, I think it's all about being in nature. It's about being outdoors. Right. So one of the big spends on this is this big wraparound porch, the shade area, the fire pit, and I'm going to do one hot tub. This is going to be the only unit that's going to come out. <laughs> yeah, cool. That's um, awesome. You know, I, I've got some great partnerships with several vendors. I really 
part of the vision of building this out too, especially for, for who I am and in this business, I want this to be a little bit of a kind of a showroom, right? I want people that I'm working with to be able to come and stay and, and see some different units and spend the night in it, see what it's like in, in all these different kinds of tents. To have this be kind of a, almost a, an outdoor lab space for anybody that wants to come and learn glamping, right? So some of the rest of this is sort of yet to be decided. We'll, we'll yeah. see, but I wanna do a, a quick dive into the planning and zoning. So, and I hope this is a good benefit to your listeners because again, I this is what I've done for a lot of other clients. So doing it for myself, I had the roadmap, right? I knew exactly what, what the process is and what you gotta do. Most people, when they're starting this, they don't. So I, I'm giving you the peek under the cover here. I'm telling you exactly <laughs> what you need to do. So the first thing I did was I went out, I am in city limits for Tonganoxy. So I went out to the city's website and then I did a search for their vision plan. So the, and every time I found something, I just saved it in the folder. I was like, I will look at it in a minute. But right now <laughs> I'm just gonna save it down, right? So right here, you can see highlighted, this is my property and we're in that green zone. And if I zoom in here, where's my zoom function? Yeah, so that light green, I am zoned currently RR, which is rural, which again, when you look at kind of this whole area right along the, the highway, pretty common, right? I'm, I'm RR, rural residential, that's my current zoning. And then, so then I looked up this map, which is future development and so, this right here is my property in the yellow. And if we look at that, it's planned future use is low density residential. Which is the best. Yes. Yep. So then I looked up the land use. Okay. First was zoning, and then this is land use. The yellow in this case is public land, semi-public land, and floodplain. So the yellow in this case is is land that cannot be developed. Okay, so so it's still good. Yeah, and just because it's residential it doesn't mean you can't have a glamping operation on there. No, I'm no, residential. Not at all. Yeah, and then this is the the long range map that the county has adopted for the 2440 corridor. So the, they're looking at mainly all the intersections, the corridor roads, the collector streets. They're planning for how is my town going to grow and what do they want to see in some of those areas. And so if I zoom in, this little corner right here is my property. You can okay. see the little green dotted lines. Those are all pathways and trails. And a lot of these already exist. You'll notice back in all my renderings, all, all my units have bicycles. Yeah, parking. right, right. That's one of the things that we're just going to provide. There's yep. going to be two bicycles in every site. We're we're on that network of pathways and trails that come all through downtown. That go past three of our restaurants. They connect with our park system, the pickleball courts, the swimming pool, all the wonderful amenities that we have in town. They're all off of this pathway and trail, and and they come almost right up to my door. So you know, again, I think it's part of being creative. Yep. Part of what I want people to do is go and explore my small town, spend money at those mm -hmm. businesses fall in love with Tongue and Oxy just like we did and, and support all of that. But it's also a fun experience. And from a development perspective, I can buy a bunch of bikes. I don't have to build any of that. It's already here. I just have to, <laughs> you don't have to build the trails. It's just you provide the bikes and they will, they will go. Yeah. And then kind of looking around. So, you know, they've, they've planned an improved intersection at this, this intersection here for the future, probably a, a, a lighted intersection or a, a roundabout or something. I feel like it should happen already. We've got really horrible traffic there in the morning with school drop off and pick up. But all this area that's shaded, they in the, the long range plan would like to see developed. So we're, we're in an opportunity zone. We're in a development zone. We're in a, along that 24, 2440 corridor. They want to see development there. So when we look under allowed uses, residential, that's my home. That, that's all my neighbors' homes. They're, it's residential use. That's allowed. Moderate agriculture. So I can have some animals. I could have horses. I got some chickens. You know, whatever I can responsibly fit on five acres of land, I would be allowed to do. With the exception of the following, intensive feeding operations. Can't do that. So no, no chicken barns with 10,000 birds in them. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I can have a backyard coop. That's fine. No garbage or feeding garbage, so no pigs. And any use within 300 feet of a residential or retail business structure that results in offensive odor, dust, or noise. That's the only thing you can't do. Okay. 
That's it. It doesn't fit any of those. Yeah, so so under my residential, you know, and, and again, looking at, is this allowed under my zoning? They're saying these, these are the three things that are the exceptions. They're not allowed under the residential use. Other uses, a secondary residential use. So like I can have a pool house, a guest house, um, or I can do accessory uses. So one, two, or five, up to five structures that are related, customary, and subordinate to the existing structure on the site. So I can have up to five guest houses under rural residential, as long as they're all smaller than my primary residence, which is my home. Easy to do. The single farm building shall occupy more than 1% of the total square footage of the lot. No um, problems. These are other types of uses that are allowed in rural residential. Education, internment facilities, so prisons or jails, a church, an airport, any kind of municipal services. So that could be a, a bus station or a, a highway patrol, you know, depot or a water treatment plant. Any of those things would be allowed in, in the RR zoning. Safety, so police, fire. And then here I have circled what I think best applies to me. Yeah. Lodging facilities. Yeah. So that is a by right use under the RR zoning, which is what my property is, is currently zoned as. And that's the only commercial use that's permitted in okay. RR is a lodging facility. Now it's classified as lodging facilities one. So that gives us a hint that there's something else that we still need to go look at. So then we get down to this one here, special uses as allowed in section 22. So personal care facilities, lodging facilities two and three, recreational entertainment two and three, or home occupations. Okay, so that might be what you fall under for special use, but that's a special use, so, just get a permit for it. So we're gonna go look at it. Okay, let's, let's figure this one out. And then there's some requirements in here too. So development standards, no temporary storage structures or movable containers except for temporary dumpster rentals. Minimum lot area is one acre. I got five acres, so I'm, I'm good there. Mm -hmm. Newly annexed properties are automatically zoned RR until they can be rezoned. Minimum 160 feet of frontage to get a driveway. That's why I said I'm lucky that I've already got two driveways that are existing. Right. I can't go more than 35 feet high or two and a half stories which again, for glamping That's tents, so yeah. single story structures. So I'm okay there. Floor area minimum is a hundred, a thousand square feet for the main dwelling. There's no right. limitation on accessory dwelling units. And then your standard setbacks. So 50 foot front yard, 20 feet from the side yards, 50 foot from the rear yard. Those are in my city's, you know, standard planning and zoning codes. Okay. So now we've got three potentials. We've got lodging facilities, one, two, or three. So now we need to look up I bet you have a PDF for that, don't you? What those are. Yeah. There we go. Now that looks very similar to my website, my my county website. Big so, whole chart. We scroll so we're down. Looking, we're looking for com commercial accommodations, one, two, and three. Lodging facilities, yeah. that's it. Lodging facilities provided for tourists, mm -hmm. travelers, and short-term recreational use. Sounds like glamping to me. That's exactly glamping, yeah. Campground. So these are examples. Campground, mm -hmm. a summer camp, a base lodger hunting camp, a ski resort, a vacation farm or dude ranch, retreat cabins, an RV park, or a country inn. Those are all descriptions of what they think Lodging 3 represents. And you see the X under RR, and then you see the S in parentheses. Special so use. S is a special use permit. Yep. Yes. So if I actually go up and I look at... Which means it's allowable with the permit. With a special use permit. Correct. Yeah. And when I studied this, that's where I felt like I probably fit the best. A, a vacation farm perfectly describes what we're trying to build. Yeah. I'm but curious what, the, uh, what number one, the, the first one, the one that you didn't need a special use permit. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Let me see where. Okay, here's the other two. Lodging facilities provided for tourist travelers or short-term residential use for less than six months. So they're limiting it to six months of use out of the year. So that classifies okay. as rooming, boarding houses, or lodging houses. And again, keep in mind back to the accessory dwelling units that I can do up to five units mm -hmm. under lodging one. So if I were to say, I'm gonna build five units and that's it, they're all gonna be subordinate to my main structure. I'm never gonna do more than five and they're just gonna be boarding rooms for rent i can do it without any special use permit yeah for six months out of the year 
And so you go six no, months. I can use, I can only rent them for six months. So like I can't rent it to somebody to stay for a year. The stay is, is short term residential use. So they can't stay with me for longer than six months, but I can operate year round. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I misread that at first. So yeah, short term resident that short term residential use less than six months. So I'm, I'm not allowed to have a tenant living in there for six months or longer, Okay, which I wouldn't yeah. want to do with glamping anyway. Yeah. You don't want to do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So reading this, the way I understood it, the way I interpreted it, and the way I presented it to the city was if I wanted to do five units or less, I don't even need your permission. It's by right. It's allowable mm -hmm. right here. Right. I'm doing five accessory dwelling units that are subordinate to my main structure. That's allowable under the code. And as long as I don't have a renter in there for six months, I'm, I'm good. And I don't need any special use permit to do that. Is that why you're phasing this in? So you won't get a special use permit right out of the, right out of the <laughs> gate? I could do that. I'm not going to do that. So lodging facilities too, same thing, lodging provided for tourist travelers, but this is classified as a hotel, motel, hostel, or resort, and that requires a special use permit. Now, the problem with this, and this came up when we, we discussed everything with your project, is that puts us into International Building Code, IBC, because this is a commercial use, a hotel, motel, right? And I don't want to get into an IBC. Because again, I'm not putting fire sprinklers in a, in a glamping tent, which if we were to meet full IBC standards for a hotel or motel, that would be required. Yeah. So these two were options. And, and frankly, lodging one is a good option for me because it means I can go do whatever I want whenever I want to. Yeah. And so I felt like the logical way to do that was to just go ahead and start the process, do it right from the get-go, apply for a special use permit. And so this is the route that we're choosing now. Hopefully that goes well. If it doesn't, I can still go do five units on my property without <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would like the ability to do more than that eventually. And I'd rather do that up front and, and be honest with what our plans are. I absolutely could have gone and, and built five tents and opened up and you know, screw you to all my neighbors in the city and everybody else. And, and then if I'd have tried to go in and get five more units, probably no way in hell that would ever happen. No, no. <laughs> you would have, you, those bridges would have been burned. Yeah. Right. Right. So we're trying to do it right from the beginning, from the get-go. How many lodging facilities, two are or three, are there in, in your town? There, there's actually a few. Okay. So we have a we have a dude ranch that's a little bit outside of town. The one wedding venue, Deer Ridge, that's north of us, they have a few little guest houses on property, not enough. I, I think they've got four or five bedrooms that when they okay. rent out for a wedding, you get those five bedrooms for your wedding party or your a bride's parents or groom's parents or something like that. And so that's that's how they're classified is is under that that same they have a special use. We we actually have a an old hotel. It's not used as a hotel. It's a yoga studio right now. That property is still zoned for lodging. It it's never been changed in in years of different changes of use and all that. And so after I did my research and figured out where this fits, where I thought it was best, what I was looking at for the process to get through the city. Then we sat down and we put together what's called a narrative. So this is kind of your chance to tell your story, right? And and I use a template. I use this with a lot of my clients and people we work with. I'll send them this. And I'm like, okay, rewrite it in your words. Tell me what it is that you want to do on your property. What are we trying to build here? And 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 what it is. So, you know, in three sentences, and Jay Hawker, by the way, this is the name that we chose. So in my area, my, my wife and I are both Jayhawks. We both went to the University of Kansas and this area of Northeast Kansas. The reason that the Jayhawks are popular, it actually has nothing to do with the university, it predates the university. So Jayhawkers were, were settlers, early settlers that came to Kansas and a lot of them settled here in Northeast Kansas in order to establish Kansas as a free state. So at the time, Congress in the U.S. was was pretty evenly split between slave states and free states. And Kansas was getting ready to come in as the next state. And it was going to tip that balance of power one way or the other. Mm. And so there were a lot of Missouri settlers, they called them Missouri ruffians, who, who jumped the border over to Kansas just to vote in the election and vote for slavery. And you had a lot of early settlers, a lot of abolitionists, a lot of, you know, kind of the conscientious objectors that, that literally pulled up roots somewhere in the East Coast and moved out to Kansas territories and, and 
took land grants and settled down and built houses and farms and settled in Kansas out of the hopes of bringing Kansas into the union as a free state. And those people that did that were called Jayhawkers. That's so interesting history. In our area, you've got Jayhawk everything. You've got Jayhawk motors, you've got Jayhawk gutters, Jayhawk roofing. Jayhawk is kind of everywhere. And of course, it's the mascot for the University of Kansas as well, the, the mythical bird, the Jayhawk. And I, I really like when we moved up here and I was thinking about names for our property, I, I was actually, I was calling a, a vineyard up in New York when we ordered our vines that we planted and they said, well, what's the name of your farm? And without really thinking about it, I said, Jayhawker farm. And they were like, okay. And then two weeks, three weeks later, when our, our vines arrived via FedEx, I looked at the label and the label said J period Hawker farm. And I thought, huh, that, that's a different way to do it. Kind of sets you apart, you know? And so that all just kind of stuck with me. So when we decided on a name, what are we going to call this place? We decided to, to use J Hawker farm and do the J period Hawker. Well, almost like a, a name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I've actually got a, an idea about spinning this whole, like babe, the blue ox, Paul Bunyan, tall tale about this mythical settler Jay Jay Harper. who came to Northeast Kansas and settled the territory. At the, and this is the remnants of his original homestead and, and spinning some wild outlandish tale about the history of Jay Hawker farm. I think it'd just be a fun thing to, to engage guests with. And so that's the name we've chosen. The rest of this, you know, this is sort of what I would call our, our mission statement, our vision. Jay Hawker's envisioned as a peaceful retreat, catering to the need for short-term rentals and unique experiential stays in Tonganoxie. Our goal is to help guests have unique accommodations while on their way to events in Kansas City and Lawrence, while visiting local attractions or attending local events to celebrate, to reflect, or even just to have a personal place to escape. The low impact setup will entail 10 unique sites, each with individual units, creating a fun and unique stay. So again, I don't want to get into specifics and details on this because some of this I don't know. I, I, I don't know what those last five units are going to be. Right. Um, I don't want to make a promise that I can't keep. And I don't want to tell my neighbors and the other people in our community, hey, this is what I'm doing and then not follow through on it. So I want to be as specific as I can about the stuff that I know, the the look and feel and what we're trying to create. Absolutely 100 percent transparent on that. But I'm not going to get into super specific details on units or unit types or any of those things because I don't know. So some of this is also kind of legal. It's it's like required as, as part of that planning and zoning. So, so existing structures, there are currently two shed structures that store extra equipment supplies. Those are going to remain. Jayhawker will operate year round, but will likely see fewer bookings during the harder winter months, bringing beginning in July or in January and ending in March, weather permitting. So I'm saying I want to operate year round. I don't know if I can. It may be too cold. We may close down for a couple months, but I want permission to operate year round. Right. Now, um, have you submitted this yet or is this still? Yes. In the yes. So I submitted this entire package, all those zoning documents, the maps, my narrative, talking, and, and there's, we cover a lot of stuff in here, you know, wildlife, landscaping, traffic, fire protection, parking, security, lighting, all these different things, right? This is my chance to talk about all the things that I can't show in a site plan. Right. If, if it's on the site plan, they get it. If it's not on the site plan, I, I've got to spell it out in the narrative. Okay. And then these were the preliminary plans and renderings that i put together so i've got a civil site plan that shows each of the units shows the pond shows my parking area existing house existing driveway i've got several renderings that show what we want this to look like not now but you know in eight to ten years when the trees mature and grow in i've got some character examples of each of our tents and units and what each site is going to look like i've got a floor plan for what the units look like. Yeah, that's awesome. If this planning department does not accept your application, you call well, me up and I'm gonna come I'm, out I'm there and that. rough some people up. So Kansas is a little different, a little different than the rest of the country because we actually have established court case law that deals with planning and zoning. Okay. So I pulled all these renderings together into this book, all these files that I'm opening, this is all from our submittal. I basically submitted everything that's in this folder to them. And then of course, our our application for a special use permit. So we went down, we filed all that. Again, 10 units built in three phases. Each unit will serve two guests. We'll have power, water, and on-site septic. So I turned all this in, I had a pre-application meeting with the city where they brought in their planning and zoning consultant. We're small towns, so we don't have full-time staff to do that. That's a contract with a third party. They reviewed it. We sat down with Public Works. They reviewed it. They said, 
you're going to need a septic system because there's no sewer available in this area and the one that services my house is not large enough to handle an expansion so i need a new septic i said yep i know i'm planning on it they said well we need we need drawings of that system and they need to come from a septic engineer and so i got on my my county website and found the only septic engineer who's licensed to to work in leavenworth county where i live and i called him up and he did a design and engineered full drawings and plans for my septic system so we submitted that so we finally got all the documents turned in and the city said great looks like you got everything you owe us 700 dollars for the special use permit application and we'll get you on the planning agenda for the first tuesday in september and the problem was i knew i was going to be in china on and they said well what about the next month and i said well that tuesday i will be at the glamping show in arapaho colorado <laughs> so they said okay so we're looking two months out i said yeah probably so right now we've tentatively set our planning and zoning hearing the first tuesday of november well, that's and, not too bad that's no not too bad. No, and honestly, it's not on my city. It's, it's totally on me, it's just not being available and, and not asking them to like schedule a special date or special time just for me. Now, this is a, this is a meeting with the planning department, or is this a is a public this hearing? Is a, it's a public hearing. It's before the planning and zoning board or the committee, mm -hmm. which is is a group of volunteers made up of sure, people from sure. the community. I I formerly served on that board. Right. I, right. I was on planning and zoning commission for I think three or four years. Eventually my my work schedule, my travel schedule just took off and I wasn't able to be at all of the meetings. And so when my term was up, I was replaced and I was thankful for that to be done with it. And it wasn't something I sought out originally. Honestly, it was a friend of mine who was a, a contractor, you know, skilled trade in the area. He was on the board, he was stepping down and he said, I know you, you'd be great at this. I want you to apply, I think you should do it. And so I did, and I did it for four and a half years. And you um, live in a community who really wants something like this in the community. You don't yeah, sense any, I mean, any kind of, you're not whiffing out any kind of community uprising that'll They'll come out with their well, pitchforks and I'm getting there. Oh, okay. So no, I mean, overall the city was very supportive. The city staff was very supportive. You know, once they kind of wrapped their heads around it and, and mm -hmm. kind of came to it, they're like, okay, yeah, this is kind of cool. You um, want to, you want to unshare your screen so we can see your big, beautiful face. We the community, whatever you got planned here. I don't know the rest of the story. So I got to get back over here. There we go. All right. So no early conversations with the city. They were actually very supportive. The city manager actually said that they just updated their hotel feasibility study last year that said our area can actually support up to i think he said 110 keys is what the the hotel feasibility study said you know uh -huh. part of the challenge is again we're about 25 miles to lawrence to the the south and west we've got hotels a whole bunch of hotels right at the the speedway but that's that's something else you don't have We've got a NASCAR track, a major league soccer stadium, a minor league ballpark, and a major shopping center that is 25 minutes down the road that way from me. <laughs> I'm so, so jealous. <laughs> it's called the Legends. It's a very popular, very fast growing area of Kansas City. Actually, Mattel is going to build a new theme park there. It's nice. supposed to open next year sometime. Nice. And yeah. so there's already built in demand right, right away. Yes. Yeah. And, and I reached out to two of the three wedding venues that are here in town. The other one, I, I just haven't been able to nail them down yet because they're busy. They do a hundred weddings a year. They, I, they don't have time for me right now, but I've talked to the other two and kind of pitched the idea of what we were, were going to do, what we were proposing. And they loved it. In fact, the one of them, he, he told me, he said, gosh, he goes, if you build that every single wedding we book, I, I will take all of them. He goes, we usually book a wedding somewhere between nine months and a year in advance. And he said, if, if you're not open yet, or if your booking window is not that far out, every time we book a wedding, I want all of your tents and we'll just throw it in and include it in our, our wedding package. Nice. And so, and he's, he's a half a mile from me, probably less than a quarter mile as the crow flies. And uh, they're actually really receptive. They asked a lot of really good questions. Yeah. You know, I think the main thing that they were concerned with was traffic. And I said, well, look, it's 10 units. It's no more than 10 cars. All of the parking is gonna be on property. So you know, nobody's parking out along the road or anything like that. Were they, were they one of the houses that- that, that okay. We would drive past their, their home to get to ours. Okay. And I said, you know, guys, it's a public street. It's a city street. Right. Anybody can drive down that street anytime. Like mm -hmm. we could, we probably on any given day have way more than 10 cars to come up and down that road. And so, you know, it, it 
the way it's designed, the way it's engineered, that street should be able to handle hundreds of cars an hour. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm putting maybe five an hour on any given day. And that's a, if we're at a hundred percent capacity, most mm -hmm. days it's going to be, you know, two, three, four tenths. So maybe four cars over a two hour check in, check out period. It, it's nothing. And in fact, we even brought that up with the city and the city's like, no, this isn't big enough. You don't need a, a traffic study or anything like that. It's only 10 yeah. units. Yes. That was one of their concerns. Their other concern was animals. Are we going to let people have dogs? And I have this discussion with all my clients. We know the numbers, we know the statistics, you know, over half of people who go glamping would like to bring a, a, a pet or an animal with them when they go. Right. And there's a lot of resorts that are very, you know, pet friendly and have embraced that and supported that. I'm not going to be, we're, we're not going to allow animals. Part of that is out of respect for my neighbors. That's something that they requested and said, we don't want dogs running wild and guests that are here and, oh, they lost their dog. And now they're run, running through our backyard looking for, you know, Fifi or Fido. And all my neighbors around me, for the most part, have dogs. And the only one that doesn't is, is the, uh, the older neighbor to the north of me across the road. And he hates animals. He hates dogs. He hates my dogs. He, he hates a lot of things. So that's a but concession dogs, that you're you're preempting that that kind of thing. Maybe foreshadowing, yeah. But you know that was something they brought up, and I said that's easy. Like it was a concern for me anyway. So no animals, no dogs, we're good. But yeah, the only pushback I've gotten so far has been my neighbor to the north, which he is the farthest away. He's on the other side of the road. He's the least affected, the least impacted by any of this. And when I tried to talk to him, he said, I don't care. I don't want to know anything about it. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't want anything happening over there. And whatever you're proposing, I'm going to oppose it. Lovely. And I said, well, you know, I wish you'd just talk to me. Like, I <laughs> want to know your thoughts on it. He goes, my thoughts are you shouldn't be allowed to do shit over there. That was it. Wow. And a couple of his cousins in my neighborhood that are the same thing. And, and then, you know, I kind of pressed him a little bit. And turns out, like I said, he's very angry. He, he's mm -hmm. an angry, old, retired guy. He's not in the best of health. He said, you know, this house and this property, this land that I've got, that's my whole retirement. And he's like, mm -hmm. anything that you're doing over there, that's going to lose sense. value on my property. And yeah. I said, well, you know, there, there's not anything statistically or data wise that supports that claim. The yeah. glamping resort has a negative impact on properties. It, it doesn't. In fact, if anything, recent I argue that it has a positive one. Yeah, yeah, recent development in an area usually increases property values. Yeah. And and I said, you know, it's just it's not true. And there's nothing you can find that would say that that is true. And then then he really opened up. And it turns out that 30 years ago, before we even moved up here, before I even owned this home, before the prior owner to me owned this home, he paid to put in the water line at the road and to pave a half a mile of asphalt that and to do all the improvements on the roadway. And he's like, I went to all those neighbors and nobody would help me pay for it. And then three years after I put it in, I had to deed it over to the city. So it became part of the city infrastructure. And then they all connected to it. So he's holding a grudge and he's mad about the water line and the road from 30 plus years ago. And he sees, oh, we're building a glamping camp and we're going to tie into that water line. And none of that would have happened if he hadn't paid for that 30 years ago. That That's where his grudge is coming from. Now, will this will this force it to a public hearing or will you well, still be approved? To yeah, I mean, a special use permit always goes before public hearing. So yes, there, sometime in November, whenever we can get aligned on a date, we'll have a public hearing. Uh, okay. They'll send notice out to all those neighbors and he will probably show up angry and yelling mm -hmm. and screaming about he, how he's been screwed over by every neighbor and the city yeah. for the last 30 years. You know, I've tried to talk to him. He doesn't want to talk. He's not interested, doesn't care. And, and I'm not going to change his mind. The right. good news is I don't have to. No, you don't. So in Kansas, I, I mentioned we have a court case precedent and they refer to it as the golden rules. It's a set of nine rules that are now, because it went all the way to the Kansas State Supreme Court, they are codified and they're they're part of our planning and zoning law. Let me see if I can pull them up here. This might have to be a two-parter for podcast. <laughs> this is kind of what I wanted to, to get to. I think we can hold it to two hours. All right. So in Kansas, so this is the established case law that, that came out of that. 
So any sort of planning and zoning application anywhere in the state, any jurisdiction, these are the nine things that they can consider and the only nine things that they can consider when hearing a, any sort of planning and zoning action. So it, it can't be, well, somebody doesn't like it or one of the neighbors is pissed off. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. That's not in this list of stuff. So number one, the zoning, use and character of the neighborhood. So we went through that earlier. Check. Um, yeah. Rural, residential, zoned rural, lodging for up to five units is a by right use. So mm -hmm. when looking at this saying is, is short term rental is lodging, does that fit the zoning and uses and character of the neighborhood? Yeah, it's by right. I can already do five units. I want to do a few more which requires the special use permit, but you're not going to make an argument that lodging or short-term rental is not appropriate in this zone because it's mm -hmm. already allowed. It's a by right use. The suitability of the subject property to which it's been restricted. So what is the current zoning and does that work for this property? Really where this comes into play would be like if, if I was trying to rezone my property. Right. So I want to rezone it to commercial or light industrial right? Is my property appropriate for that? Probably not. I, I'm surrounded by single family residential homes. So it, is my property at five acres suitable for a, a glamping camp with, with 10 luxury high-end units on it? Yeah, it, it is. Number three deals with removing restrictions. So again, this is like for a variance or something. If, if somebody said, hey, you know, you got to have a hundred foot front yards. And I said, well, I only want 50. I'm asking to remove a, a restriction. Does that have a negative impact on surrounding property owners? Well, I'm not asking for any exemptions, any variances. We already need and will abide by all the planning and zoning standards, all the setback requirements, all the code requirements. I, I'm not asking for any exceptions. So we're not removing any restrictions. So number three doesn't apply to us. Number four, the length of time the property has remained vacant as zoned. So again, this is usually used with a rezoning of a property. If you you're trying to rezone it to something else. You say, look, this has been zoned industrial for the last 50 years and they've never built a factory or warehouse on it because this area doesn't work for industrial. That's why we want to change it to residential. So you're, you're making that argument that this land has been undeveloped because whatever it's currently zoned as is not what's best for it. That doesn't really apply in this situation. Relative gain to the public health, safety, or welfare as compared to the loss in value or hardship imposed upon the applicant. So this is really comes up with like environmental issues. Yeah. Back when we were talking about like the chicken barns. Yeah, uh, right. Yes. Yeah. I, as a private property owner, might want to put a thousand chickens in a barn on my property, but the negative impact to public health and welfare for all the neighbors and anybody that's downwind of that, that's more important than what I want to do with my property. So you'd look, is there a risk to the public health, safety, or welfare from a glamping resort? Probably not. So that one most likely doesn't apply. And number six, conformance of the request to change to the adopted or recognized comprehensive plan. So that's why I went through all those maps and drawings in the, the upfront. When we look at our comprehensive plan, they've called for two things. One, they want more commercial development along that 2440 commercial corridor, which we fit inside of. And two, they've called specifically for lodging or the development of lodging. So we're in conformance with the master plan, with the adopted 20, 2440 corridor development plan and with the 2020 vision plan that was adopted by the city and by Leavenworth County. They've said this is the kind of development we want to want to see in this area and we're in alignment with that. The impact of proposed development on community facilities. So do you have adequate water, sewer? Are you putting an unnecessary impact on the road with lots of traffic? Are you going to put a whole bunch of kids in the school system? Is it going to become a burden for police or fire or the library, yeah. again, this is like for single family home developments, right? If a home right. developer comes in and says, we're going to put 150 more home sites in town and we don't want to pay property taxes for the next 20 years. That's a problem, right? Because those 150 homes are going to have 300 to 450 kids. That's going to be a huge impact on our school system and they don't want to pay property taxes for it, right? right. right. So when you look at a glamping resort, talking about 10 units, these are not permanent mm -hmm. residents. They're not putting kids in our school. They're, they're not probably utilizing our, our schools or our library, hopefully our parks. I'm going to give them a bike. I want them to get to the parks, but are they going to have a negative? There's a lot of conceiving children at, at, at glamping sites. Though. Are we going to put a burden on police or fire? 
No. And they didn't want a road impact study either. So, so no, no, again, we're less than 10 cars, even at 100% capacity. So we have minimal impact. But, and this was something my city manager was very excited about, this does qualify for the hotel occupancy tax. So Ooh. all of our guests will pay a hotel occupancy tax that will go to the city of Tonganoxie. And that tax is specifically earmarked to help them promote tourism and events that bring people into the area. And so he's like, this is great. Not only does it not put any load or impact on city services, you're actually paying special taxes that help mm -hmm. us attract people to come and visit Tonganoxie. This is a win-win. Like yeah. we get extra money from you and you're not putting any impact on city services. So that, that was, again, another reason they were very supportive. They were excited about that because they have nothing right now outside of two Airbnbs that generates them hotel occupancy tax anywhere in city limits. So you got um, the first seven checked off pretty easily, but what about number eight, Zach? So number eight, opposition <laughs> support of neighborhood residents. So that's mm -hmm. listed, but then look at specifically what it says. This is only one factor to be considered and by itself is not sufficient reason to approve or deny a request. And that's really the only, a neighbor complaining will not bury your oh, project. It can't. It's yeah. right there in Kansas right there in law. The yeah, yeah. law. It's in, not even in the code. It's, it's established entrenched. case law in Kansas yeah. that having a neighbor who doesn't want it cannot be the grounds for dismissal or for denial. And, and again, part of that reason is why I've gone out and talked to those people that are going to benefit from a project like this, because just like you, when you went through your process, you need supporters yeah. as much as you need to dispel the the distractors. Right. 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 My my grumpy old curmudgeon of a neighbor across the road. There's nothing I can do about it. He won't even talk to me. In fact, yeah. you could read if they read this correctly. All of your neighbors could be opposed to this. All of them could be. Still I don't cannot want, be. I want to be a good neighbor. If they yeah. have something they're concerned about, I want to be able to address it, respond to it. I want to be fair, you know, but again, very early on in, in my outreach, I ran into one neighbor who's just like, nope, absolutely not. Don't care whatever it is. I'm going to oppose yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? I don't need your support. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that with me. I'll see you at the meeting, but you know, you don't like it can't be adequate reason to to try to stop it. And it says it right there in Kansas state law. And then the last piece is the recommendation of staff. So this has to be based on those preceding eight things that are up there. So they're saying city staff, county staff, or if you've hired a third party consultant to do that, they're supposed to review all of this, all these factors, all the plans that were submitted, all the technical reports, the site plan, my narrative, all my drawings and renderings, all those different things. They're supposed to look at it as a whole and look at any potential negatives that can come out of it, weigh those factors, compare it to the golden rules, and then staff makes a recommendation. And, and that's really in my area. I want city staff right. to come back and say, we've reviewed this. We've vetted it. We've met with our consultants. We've looked at the law. We've looked at our zoning ordinances. This thing meets all the requirements and we recommend that it gets approved. It's rare, at least in my area, that something would go before planning and zoning where the staff recommends approval. And then again, the other part of the special use permit or conditional use permit is there are things that may come up in that meeting, you know, and again, back to that narrative, some of the things that we put in there are, are like quiet hours, you know, sound, noise. I, I've got two venues around me that do live music nights and, and you can hear it, sound carries. I mean, I can lay in my bed and hear it. It's usually done by 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, which is in line with the county noise ordinance. You know, they abide by it, but there's a couple of neighbors over here that absolutely friggin' hate it. And, mm -hmm. and they call them in for noise complaints and everything all the time. Uh, yeah. And their special use permit needed to be renewed. And it, it came up before the county and all these neighbors complained and they said, all right, we know that the county ordinance is 11 p.m., but for you, it's 10. And he said, deal, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, I'll accept it. So under those conditional use permits, any condition they can ask you. So there, there may still be something that comes up out of that meeting. Again, I don't want surprises. And that's why I wanna to talk to, to everybody and do that outreach and, and build that support ahead of time. But there may still be something that comes up and it may not be a deal breaker for us. It, it may be like, okay, yeah, fine. We we can deal with that. We'll accept it. Let's move on. So, well, listen, go ahead and unshare the the screen there. That was very enlightening. And uh, there's 
there's codified law for you. I think there's more, we have criteria too. Very similar, very similar stuff. Uh, yeah. But like, like you said at the beginning of the podcast that every jurisdiction is different in America because this yeah. is America. We just make things complicated, but actually I think it's a better, the better world than having, you know, some King in Washington, DC deciding what, what goes on in our, uh, yeah. In lo- our local country. control is, is better. It, it does make for a messy process sometimes, but yeah. So yeah, kind of to summarize all that, the look ahead for me right now is our dry season in Kansas. It, it's been like three weeks since we've had any rain and that's what they look for. That is a perfect time. So the, the pond area that I had on my property, it's a spring fed pond. That spring is dry right now. So now is the time to, to build the pond. Nice. nice. Because we are doing this on our property and we bought this in 2012. And I don't need to tell everybody what's happened to real estate values over 12 years. <laughs> I have a lot of equity. A little bit of equity in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot, like more equity than I have debt on it. And so I, I'm not going to have to take a small business loan or SBA loan or, or a private loan or anything. Just like you, we're, we're going to start with a home equity. Loan. As you go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. A HELOC. Borrow, that's, that's nice. borrow against the equity that we've got built up in this place. And I'm making an improvement to it. So I kind of feel good about, yes, we're going to take on some debt. Interest rates aren't great right now. We're at like eight and a half percent, but I'm also trying to kind of time this to where I think we'll be open with our first couple of units by early spring, April, May. That's um, awesome. And yeah. I need that much time to, to build everything out and get the pond built and get utilities infrastructure, get some of the site work done. We're going to winter hit. Nobody's going to do anything for end of December, January, February, which is usually a, a busy travel time for me because we come off of all the trade shows through October, November into early December. That's where I line up with a lot of new clients and meet a lot mm-hmm. of new people. And then I'm, I'm pretty much on the road until April or May. And so I'm going to be gone. It's cold. The ground's frozen. So we're not going to be doing much for, for those couple of months in there. And then, you know, kind of as things thaw, so early April, May, be able to knock out some of the construction with really the goal being to be able to do kind of a grand opening celebration somewhere around the 4th of July next summer. Probably do a soft opening, have a few people out, you know, in in May or June to stay in a couple of those units, get some early reviews built, you know. Maybe the glamping guy can make a visit and (laughs) follow up podcast or something. That would be fun. I would love, actually, I'm, I'm very serious about that. I would love to travel out there just to see your grand opening. No, I, I, and that's part, part of, part of my that. plan is is to bring in some influencers and bring in some of my friends from the industry and, and partners and people we work with and, and tell me what I did wrong. Help me learn. You know, let me pick your brain. And you know, uh, early on in the podcast, I, I did mention, I, I wanted to just explain that I was traveling from Tennessee back to Colorado and I called you up and said, hey, I need a place to stay because I, I was driving by myself. I Long story. I had carpooling out there and then and then I was by myself. So so yeah, you got to spend the time with your family, got to yeah. meet your wife and kids, and 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 you gave me the walking tour and and this whole vision <laughs> for your property. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And so yeah, I'm 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 very happy for you, Zach, that you're that you're making this leap into the into the glamping world because you're such an expert at it. But now you're 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 actually well, I've got to live it and not just talk. <laughs> you're walking the walk now. That's, that's <laughs> different, right? And I, I put yeah. my own money where my mouth is, and yeah. all the all that advice, everything that I've I've you know tried to tell clients over the years, I've got to go do it now. Time you know, come. we are excited. Like yeah. I said I actually ordered the first tent. It, it arrived. <laughs> we got the Amazon tent in. Started buying some lumber. Started watching some of the uh, the auction sites and things. I'm looking for that soaker tub. I'm, I'm hunting deals. Gonna get, the, gonna, get, gonna get kind of tub or, or, or some kind of just. I want a deep soaker tub. Something yeah. you know people can get all the way up to their neck in the water. Yeah, but it's go. also been kind of fun. You know, something that my wife and I are getting to do together because you know the first time she sat down with me, she was like, "Look, this is your business," and I was like. No, we're doing this together or we're not doing it. Like, I need your buy-in. I need your support. And she's like, no, no, no. I'm excited about it. That's not what I'm saying. What I meant was, I don't know anything about this. Like, this is your business. This is your industry. She's like, I I know my business. I mean, she's a doctor, by the way. She's she's way smarter (laughs) than I am. But she's like, I'm an expert in, in my business, in my industry, but I don't know anything about this industry. And I sat down and I talked to her and I said, yeah, but you do. And she's like, well, what do you mean? I said, you love cooking for people. You love taking care of people. You love talking with people. 
you are hosting and entertaining. That I gift of hospitality, you. man. Yeah. You feed people either through their soul or through their stomach. Either yeah. way, they love taking care of people. <laughs> nice guest room too. So yeah, yeah. And so, you know, when we talked through it, I said, no, you really do know a lot of this. But that's been fun. I mean, you know, when she goes to the thrift store in town, she texts me a photo. What do you think of this lamp? Could we use it in a glamping tent? <laughs> like, it, it's just little stuff, but we're really having a lot of fun kind of getting cool. into it and, and doing it. We're we're under 30 days out to close on on the loan. They should be starting the pond construction sometime in the next week or two. They thought it would take at least a couple months. So the goal is maybe by maybe by Halloween, got all the dirt work done for the pond, maybe start Please. getting some of the septic system installed getting the new water line in, getting some utilities and stuff roughed in, hopefully before the ground freezes and winter hits. We'll definitely do a follow-up with you. Maybe maybe one year from now, you know, after your first season behind you and, and we'll be able to compare the, the two episodes because this is, well, this is said, cool. Target right now is hopefully, fingers crossed, 4th of July. 4th of July. We, we always do a big shindig. We have 40, 50 friends out to our place do a big fireworks show and all that and I'd, I'd really like to do that this year with everybody sitting on the beach in those those little cabanas and loungers looking out over the pond and i want to be shooting all those fireworks from the top <laughs> the on the side uh, and then any of our friends that want can stay with us for the night go, go pick sweet a beans oh well consider me there this, that would be fun <laughs> all right zach thank you very much this was great okay where can people find out about you if they want to actually talk with you about business, go ahead sure. and wrap them off your things. So I'm on LinkedIn, Zachary Stoltenberg, Clockwork Architecture. I'm the director of outdoor hospitality for Clockwork. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, just under my name. I don't I don't have any pseudonyms. I'm I'm not, you know, Ninja Killer 45 or anything. It's just <laughs> I'm I'm boring. It's just Zach, Zach Stoltenberg. Introduction email to All right. Thank you, Zach. Right. Wasn't that just the best? I really have a lot of respect for Zach and what he's doing out there in Kansas City and what he's doing for the greater glamping community. Uh, so go ahead and find him at Clockwork and be sure, and, and like he said on his social media channels, follow the guy. He is one to follow. And he, like I said before, he's got his hands in a lot of different glamping operations, including my own. I shared that one in the actual episode. And um, and and he's just a friendly guy and, and likes to help people. And hey, I want to give you two commercials here. One is to go to the Glamping Show USA. Both Zach and I will be there. A lot of glamping operators will be there. A lot of glamping guys like me will be there. I'm the glamping guy, but there's a lot of people in the industry who, like Zach, like me, who just want to get to know landowners and, and help them develop their property uh, for all sorts of reasons. One is because we really just enjoy glamping. Uh, but for others, um, we might have some services that we can offer you and, um, and, and, and help you along. One of which is my second commercial is my easy entry to glamping business class. I teach this just once a year. I don't teach this all year long because I'm a busy guy. I've got my own operations going on. But I do take some time in the fall and through the, through the month of October and and it is um, and it's a it's a four video course. It's free, and I just love to do it online for people, whether they're attending the glamping show or not. So that registration is open right now at the time of this release. So go to glampingguy.com/easy. Sign up for the easy entry to a glamping business, and uh, and I'll be releasing that later in October. Actually, it's early October, so you want to get on board right away. And if you are listening to this podcast after that launch. Don't worry, still go to glampingguy.com slash easy and get on the waiting list because I will be teaching it again in the future, probably next year, maybe even sooner. Who knows? It kind of depends on how much interest I get. So go ahead and get on the waiting list and we will see you in class. Thanks. I'm Chris Jube, the Glamping Guy, helping landowners build safe, legal, and profitable glamping operations on their private property. We'll see you next time.